you know, two months of two months, two months of occupational therapy. What we're going to do is then that school, when the occupational therapist comes back, is going to have to give them extra occupational therapy sessions to help them get caught up. So that's what compensatory education usually looks like. A student with an IEP didn't get some kind of service that they should have gotten. And so then the school has to give them extra IEP services to compensate, to make up for that initial loss. That's the basic idea. The pandemic came along. And when the pandemic came along, it's not like we have a couple kids at one school who didn't get occupational therapy for a month or two. It's like we have tens of thousands of kids all across the state who didn't get anything at all for months on end because they couldn't access remote learning. So that's compensatory education on a huge scale. So the state of Massachusetts came along and said, okay, we know that there are gonna be thousands and thousands of kids who are going to be entitled to compensatory education because of the pandemic. So because there are so many kids who are gonna need compensatory education, and this is such a like unprecedented, weird situation, we, the state of Massachusetts, are gonna develop some guidance that says, hey, schools and families, when you think about compensatory education in terms of how to compensate kids for what they missed during the pandemic, um, we're gonna call that COVID Comp Services, CCS, and we're gonna give you a whole framework to decide what kinds of CCS services different kids can get. So this is the definition that the state provides of CCS. So it's services that a student's IEP team determines are needed to remedy a student's skill or knowledge loss or lack of effective progress that resulted from delayed, interrupted, suspended, or inaccessible IEP services because of the emergency suspension of in-person education related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's a little bit less jargony, right? Still not great, but a little bit less jargony. And what the state is saying there is we're gonna take this longstanding remedy, compensatory education, we're gonna apply it to the pandemic and we're gonna call it CCS. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna pause there and see if there are any questions about this. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Liz, I'm keeping a running tab of questions from the chats so okay. at any time just let me know if you want me to read um okay yeah let's see if we have any questions on this just ccs so far um i think there's a specific question um when it comes okay. to do you want me to read that it is uh, sure sure um the question is from a parent asking what if an iep says 45 minutes four days a week and mm -hmm. instead the school does something different say mm -hmm. 60 minutes in three days over three days to make the time even so mathematically it looks right but it's not what the iep says not the same number of days okay we will get there i have okay. a question excellent so we will come back to that oh, i have like a question so yeah please okay um, so, I'm gonna yeah. so melinda oh, we have you yeah. can we have you unmuted if you'd like to ask a question Yes, I would. So I have a child who's in high school who's in a secondary we program. We can't hear you, Melinda. Can you hear? I'm uh, sorry. I can, can hear. You hear me? Oh, you can? Uh -huh. Okay. I can, yeah, I can hear. hear. Okay. So I'm a parent of a child who's in a secondary post program at Charlestown High. Now, we just had a parent group meeting with our principal, and he was talking about the um, compensatory um, program. So my question is, Okay, if your child um, is eligible for that, when would this take place? And um, when would he be able to use the services? And would this affect, because he's 20 years old, would this affect um, his transitioning after school? Like, would this affect his DDS service if he's 
um, not finished by the time that he's supposed to be finished. Um, so you're asking if a student gets CCS, yeah, um, such that their graduation, their planned graduation um, date is delayed. Would that affect DDS eligibility? Is that, is well, that, you have that right? Yeah, because what he was saying was that, because I was asking about this question, are they going to be able to make up the time that they lost because, you know, they're high in need and maybe all the help mm -hmm. they can get for transitioning mm -hmm. and a lot of stuff they're not getting right now. So mm -hmm. I said to him, how would they make up that time? And he was explaining mm -hmm. different ways on how um, they can make up that time. Uh, one is compensatory, or he said, if we kept that child behind or something, it could affect their services. Because normally what happens when they turn 22, any, um, I forgot the chapter, I think it was 618 or something that they're supposed to be getting after, that could affect um, their um, services like that. Is that true? Um, so my, the first part of it is it depends on the specifics of your child situation, Melinda. In general, what I would say is the Department of Developmental Services, DDS, typically does not provide most services to most kids while they are in school. They say it's the school district's job to provide services until they graduate. So it is possible that if your child's graduation was delayed or they got extra services from the school, the DDS might say, oh, they're still in school, so we're not going to provide services yet. But that's not a reason to not take CCS, I would say, um, because the services, the transition and academic services that your child likely needs are going to, like, they're going to have to come from the school. So I think I'm going to leave it there for now, but you're welcome to shoot me an email. Um, or give me a call or text or what have you to sort of go more in depth about that. And we can also leave some time at the end for like age 22 questions. Does that help? So, but if they stay in school longer, does, I mean, will DDS still, whenever they graduate, say he's supposed to graduate and he's 22, but he only graduates to some He's 23. They still obligated to whenever he finished school to step in, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay, yeah, that's my correct. question. Thank oh, you. Okay. Yes, no problem. I think Thank Kim you. also had a question. Yes. Sorry. I... Oh, hello? I can hear you, Kim. Go ahead. Sorry about that. So, um, BPS sent out an email saying that students would be provided compensatory services via Zoom mm -hmm. um, during the April vacation and um, some other times. And if they couldn't access the Zoom, they would be provided compensatory services um, over the summer. Mm -hmm. Is that a guidance or is that a, you know what I mean? That's what no, that's something Boston made up. And we will, we will talk about that more in like 20 minutes. So Kim, okay. when we get to the part where we talk about online versus in-person CCS, if you still have questions, please raise your hand again when we get there. Okay. And Elizabeth, one more question. Um, do parents have to ask for CCS or will the school identify students who should receive CCS as a team? Um, every student with an IEP should have a CCS meeting, all of them, unless, unless it's a situation where a student is doing much better and remote and it's very clear to everyone that the student doesn't need CCS, then the parents in the school could decide, we, don't, we know this child hasn't regressed, we don't need to hold a meeting. But otherwise, unless you have specifically said, I, don't, I do not think my child needs CCS, the school should affirmatively offer to hold a CCS meeting. Um, that doesn't mean that they will. And uh, if you think your child might need CCS, I'd suggest asking for it, even though you shouldn't have to. All right, any other questions? Yeah, can I ask okay. one more question? Mm -hmm. uh, so the school also said it didn't matter what hours that the child missed, because uh, I asked for, you know, how many hours um, my child missed of 
um, their services. And they said that it didn't matter the hours, it just mattered the regression. Mm. Um, I know where the school is coming from on that point, and we will get there too. Okay. I'm great. sorry, Kate, you got like 20 minutes and then hopefully you'll have answers to all of these. Okay, um, any other questions so far? Okay, cool. So I'm now gonna talk about what a CCS meeting should look like. Basically, there's three questions that the IEP team is supposed to ask. The first question is, I've split it into two because I think it's confusing the way it was written. Here's sort of the way the first question is, is phrased. It's about whether or not special education services were not offered or inaccessible. So this question says, were there services in your child's IEP that BPS did not offer? So for example, this could be like, let's say your child had physical, was supposed to get physical therapy. And the school is like, well, we just can't provide physical therapy from March through whenever the student eventually returned to in-person. So your child's just not getting physical therapy. That's an example of a service that DPS did not offer. Then the second part of this question is, were there services in your child's IEP that BPS did offer, but your child could not access them? So for example, let's say your child was supposed to get counseling once a week and it's a pandemic and it's a really hard time. And your kid was like, I'm not getting out of bed to turn on counseling because I hate doing it over Google Meet and I'm not doing it. And it's too, I'm, too upset, I can't, I won't. In that situation, that would be a service that Boston offered, but your child could not access. Or let's say your Chromebook broke and the Boston took three weeks to get you a new one. That might be a situation where they were technically offering a service, but because you didn't have a working Chromebook, your child couldn't access that service. So this is the first question. Were there services in your child's IEP that Boston did not offer, or were there services in your child's IEP that Boston did offer, but your child couldn't access them? Then the next question is, did your child demonstrate significant regression in skills? So this, oh, sorry, I've got a little PowerPoint problem. And then the last question is, did your child fail to make effective progress towards their IEP goals or the general curriculum? Okay, so these are, these are the three questions that are supposed to be asked to give us the information to determine whether or not a student is going to um, qualify for CCS and what kinds of CCS services they might need. These three questions. Okay. And now let's talk about what CCS services might look like. So the first thing to know is that CCS services are supposed to be individualized to really help your specific student with their specific needs. So I know I've heard some of, some, from some of my clients and some, from some families and from, I think it was Kim earlier who said that Boston is saying to some families, okay, you can do online learning now or in person over the summer. And if you don't want that, sorry. That is not gonna cut it. That is not what, state, what the state says Boston has to do. This is really supposed to be an individual um, you know, inquiry that's really thinking about what does this kid need to recover what this kid has lost. So I would encourage you, you, as you think about what kinds of services your child might need to get to, to be creative and use your imagination and think about what your child thinks would really truly help them in school. But to give you an idea of some examples, one thing you could ask for is a temporary placement change. So maybe it's the case that your child really needs a much more intensive placement for a short period of time to help them get caught up. <clears throat> maybe your child needs extra services that are already in your child's IEP. So maybe your child is supposed to get speech and language therapy and they missed it 
And now they really need speech and language multiple times a week in order to get caught up. An important point here, this was the first question that Charlie read to us from the chat is, does the district need to offer you like hour for hour what your child missed? The answer to that is no. So if you had, if your child got, um, let's say speech and language therapy once a week for 45 minutes and Boston says, okay, we're gonna keep that once a week for 45 minutes. We're gonna continue to give this child her regular speech and language, but she didn't get, wasn't able to access speech and language March through, let's say October. So we, are, we think she needs more speech and language services a week. So we're gonna give her speech and language three times a week for, but the other two sessions will just be half an hour, not 45 minutes. And we're gonna do that, let's say through the end of the school year. That could be a reasonable offer. It doesn't, it's not about matching up the services hour to hour for what the child missed. It's really thinking about what does this kid need to help get caught up. So for example, I have a client where <clears throat> things have been so challenging for her that she's really gonna need more than the hour for hour um, services that are in her IEP. She's really gonna need more than that in order to get caught up. I have other kids where they were, they're able to get caught up with just a little extra boost. So again, this goes to, it's really supposed to be an individualized decision about each individual kid. What does this kid need in order to make progress? Another thing you could ask for is new services that your student now needs. So for example, maybe your child was doing great with reading before, but now has really fallen behind and is really struggling. And maybe now they need extra support with a reading specialist. That could be a new service that they might need. Maybe they just need after school help. Like maybe they just need a paraprofessional or a tutor or a special education teacher to spend some time with them after school to help reinforce concepts, get them caught up. Maybe they need special education support after age 22. We talked a little bit about this, but typically special education eligibility ends when a student turns 22, but part of the way compensatory education works, and remember that CCS is just compensatory education with a pandemic twist. One of the ways that that works is that kids can get special education support even after age 22 when they are owed CCS. Maybe your child needs like a one-to-one -one or small group support. Like maybe they were doing great in math before, but then just refused to do math from March through now. And so now when they're back, they really need to be learning math with just like two other kids in order to help them get caught up in addition to their regular math class. That's just an example. Um, this last line, you know, Boston is offering some options to many families, but don't let that limit what you ask for. So I know that Boston has said in some cases, you know, you can have February or these sort of April vacation academies, um, or you can have extended, extended school year or this like after school tutoring program. And for some kids that may be great, but maybe you go back to the Dominican Republic to visit family every summer and you don't feel like your child has the capacity to do an April Vacation Academy because it's a pandemic and this is exhausting. Um, and if that's the case, that doesn't mean your child doesn't need CCS. It means that you and Boston need to be more thoughtful about uh, what they are going to offer you. So, all of which is to say, I know that Boston is telling some families, here are your choices, but I would encourage you to tell them that that's not what you need. You need something different and that's okay to do. Questions about any of that? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so at Boston Public School, um, like if, if, like during the summer, if they had the paras teaching the children. Um, and when they saw the paras, the paras would be working, but they 
when the, they weren't there, the powers weren't working. So they don't know if the background or if they didn't see the, like they saw the child in front of the camera, but didn't see the behaviors, you know. Um, so what if you don't agree with the team? I mean, what happens then? You mean, what if you don't agree with the team? Um, you don't agree with the team's CCS offer? Like you think your child needs something else? Yeah, like what if, oh, I, I'm just giving you different scenarios. Like what if all the teachers are new um, to your child? Um, so, you know, if the team doesn't agree with you, right, on the mm -hmm. CCS services, mm -hmm. uh, are you, uh, do you go to Jesse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the very end of the presentation, our last slide is going to be what to do when you don't agree. There's really a couple options. One is the State uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Another is the Bureau of Special Education and Appeals. A third is reaching out to us. So that will be our very last slide is talking about those options a little more in, in detail. Um, other questions that folks have? Jack. Hi, thanks. Um, uh, my question is that uh, the services that my son needs provided really can't be provided remotely and they would need to be provided in our home. Mm -hmm. um, are there staffing restrictions or caveats around in-home placement of uh, services? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know whether what Boston sort of staffing restrictions might be, but I will also say that's sort of Boston's problem to figure out, not yours or your family's. So what I would encourage you to do is, you know, this is about like kids are legally entitled to this. So what I would encourage you to do is ask for what your child needs. And then, you know, I always encourage like, we want to be reasonable, you know, if there's, if Boston says like, hey, like we can provide this service from this time, but not at that time, you know, I'd encourage you to try to work with them. Um, but, you know, if your child needs um, in-person at-home services as part of CCS, then I would encourage you to ask for that. And if let Boston refuse or reject it and hear what their reasoning is. And then, you know, there are dispute resolution options that are, are available to you if you and the school disagree. Thank you. I'm gonna go to the chat and then Lydia, I will come back to you. A question from the chat is who determines the measure of regression, progress, et cetera? Mm -hmm. The IEP team is. And over, as soon as we get past this slide, what we're gonna do is talk about how to prepare to answer those three questions. Um, did your child not get services? Have they regressed? Have they not made progress? So we're gonna go into that in depth. Thank you. Lydia? Hello. Um, I just wanted to make a comment off of what um, Jack was asking as far as the in-home learning and um, how his child needs that in-home learning. Um, so certainly there is a way to get someone or one of the teachers to come out because an example, my daughter, she had a, um, a spinal fusion done and she, was, she couldn't go to school for um, about almost a year. Um, and within that year, I was able to um, connect with the principal, the school nurses, and also um, I had to get information from the doctors or what about her learning and what she needed as far as her abilities. And they were able to uh, um, allow one of her teachers to come every day to tutor her and sit with her. So she was already basically which is another reason why she's familiar with remote learning because he brought computers to her and they were able to do all her work so that um, she wouldn't fall behind. So I just wanted to, you know, put that out there. There is a way That's to do it. And um, you just have to connect with the principal and, you know, other student engagement boards, whoever it is, their teachers have to be, his teachers have to be involved also. So 
That's great, Lydia. Thank you for sharing that experience. I'm glad you were able to get that for your daughter. Thank you and Barbara. Yeah, hi. Well, my son has a IEP. What the school he was in was um, urban science and we ha I had meetings with them. They told me they didn't honor his IEP and they didn't care about it. But now the school's closed, they send them to another school. They don't know nothing about his IEP. And it's like, I'm running into this barrier with the mis 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 communication and stuff with the school, his new school now. And they be like, well, we don't know nothing about it. We have nothing. Like, what can I do to? That that sounds terrible, Barbara. That sounds like Boston has, has really messed up here. Um, I'm going to ask you to reach out to me individually um, after the meeting so that I can learn more about what happened um, with your son and figure out how we can help. Um, so my email address and then my phone number and also number you can text if you prefer that are all on the first and last slides and um, I'll also drop them in the chat at the end. But please, oh. please reach out so we can talk about what, what happened. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I'm gonna go, I see the other two hands. I'm also gonna go to the chat. Um, I think Liz said, because I see the question about what SPED supports have you seen given for students that have turned 22 recently? Liz mentioned she is going to get into that aspect of the age, oh, age 22 and transition age. I'm just going to, go to defer that for when she gets to that section. But another question, what specifically does after school help look like? Because I was made to feel like it was my responsibility to find my child tutoring. Oh, dear. Um, you know, so after school help can look like, again, you know, whatever your child needs, you know, I, again, want to encourage you to think about like, in a perfect world, what kind of after school help would really be helpful for your child because I represent some kids where like after school help is just not a thing they can access because they get to the end of the school day, and they're exhausted. And I completely get that. And there are other kids where after school help is really a time where they can decompress and do some work and start to process some of what happened. Um, so if your child, if you have a good argument for after school help as part of CCS, that's not your job to find out. Um, that's the district's job to provide. Thank you, and one more for the chat. Um, one of, is there a fee to access these legal services? Great question. No, GBLS is free. Um, we do have income limits, so we represent families for free, but um, only up to a certain income. If you're above that income, we will always give you advice and try and find someone who can help you. But anyone is welcome to reach out and we don't charge. Are you able to tell you what the income limit is? Is it based on family size? Is it is based on family size. I don't know it. I, it's like 150% of the federal poverty line. Um, I can put it in the chat afterwards, but also like I'd encourage folks to not stress out about it. If you think you want help, you can just call us and I will tell you if you're over the income limit and we will figure out who can help. And we always advise. So I, I would encourage folks not to stress out about it. And question, when should the school be contacting you? Is there a specific window for CCS services? some family because I already they asked and it was like I was asking about Santa Claus <laughs> um the deadline so Boston was supposed to hold CCS meetings for all hip kids by December 15th we're past that date I don't think that's happened um if you're not a hip kid the state did not provide a deadline if you are a hip kid, it was supposed to be by December 15th. So if your child is back in school right now, I think reaching out to the school and letting them know that your understanding from the state guidance is that they were supposed to hold this meeting by December 15th. If we don't, if they're not a hip kid, the guidance just says as soon as practicable, which that's a little tougher, but I would just suggest reaching out and saying like, hey, we really need this meeting. Melinda? So um, two questions since you brought up um, 
when should they be contacting us? This just thought just came into my mind because I was talking to the principal and because my son IEP is coming up, he said that I can ask for it then, but is that two separate meetings? Should that be two separate it, meetings? It doesn't, it, it's up to you. I don't think it matters. Okay. I think it just okay. depends on whether or not you're like meeting, special ed meetings that last longer than an hour makes me want to, I don't know, bang your head, my head into a wall. <laughs> But if you've got a tolerance for a long meeting, then, you know, God bless, go for it. Okay, second question with the um, CCS services. Um, I know you say it's basically for kids who weren't getting the services that were on that IEP or you feel that your child may have regressed. Now, I heard people talk about speech and language um, um, therapy, uh, but th is, does that include things like, okay, again, my son, he's in a um, transitional program. so. He's supposed to do like travel training, um, job mm -hmm. search, um, go, and going out and um, to mm -hmm. the community, and all those things have seats. So would that be pertaining to that too? Would we yes, be eligible absolutely. to make those um, services as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And Jack, we'll take you as the last question before we move on. Uh, actually, this is um, uh, a side note to Barbara regarding Urban Science Academy. If your child was in the Symphonize program, Allison Doherty's program, get in touch with me through the Spedback board. I may be able to help you track down some of that information. Thank you. All right. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how to prepare for a CCS meeting. If you have ever met me, you know that I love lists. They're my favorite way to prepare for anything. Um, so I'm going to suggest that to prepare for a CCS meeting, we're going to make some lists. Now, what I'm going to describe here is, is, a, is a lot of work. So I want to tell you that this is in an ideal world. Okay, you may not be able to do all of this because like it's a pandemic and your parents and there's 15,000 things to do all the time. And that's okay. I'm going to tell you in a perfect world, if you had unlimited time, all of the things I would suggest that you do, and then you do what you have reasonable time for. That's okay. So the first thing to do, we're going to look at that first question, services that were not available or inaccessible to your child. So what we're gonna do is make a list of services that were not available or inaccessible. The first thing to do is look at your child's service delivery grid. This is a page towards the end of your kid's IEP. At the top, it says service delivery grid, and it will list all of the services that your child should have been getting. So it'll include reading specialists, counseling, um, special time with a special education teacher, physical therapy, travel training, the whole nine yards, all of that should be in the service delivery grid. So I'm going to suggest that you just list them out on a piece of paper and then identify were those services offered to your child? How often did they miss any? You don't have to be super, super specific here. Just think about like, okay, I remember that when the pandemic first happened in March, I didn't get anything from the school till like sometime in April, but then I, we tried doing virtual occupational therapy for a little while, but my student just couldn't do it, so we gave up. So maybe there's a couple sessions that they got sometime in the spring, but mostly they haven't gotten it. That's fine for these purposes. Just try and think about what you remember your kid getting. That's the first step. The next step is to ask the school for a log of all the services that they've provided March through today. <clears throat> the school should be able to give this to you. Um, they need to give it to you within 10 days. Uh, you know, you should ask, they should be able to provide you with a log listing every counseling service, every OT, they should have a record of all of that. So that's the second thing to do. And that will help bolster your own memories and your child's memories of what they felt like they were getting. So now we're gonna sort of build this list. We're gonna have each service that your child was supposed to get. So OT, reading support, physical therapy, whatever they were, travel training, those things. 
how often your child was supposed to get that service, and your best guess of the time frames that your child did not get that service. Again, because we're not doing like an hour to hour comparison, it is okay. You do not have to go through and try and identify every single date that your child missed and every single date that they attended. Um, just saying, you know, generally from March through June, they didn't really get anything. Then they got some, they got some of this over the summer, more of it picked up, like that kind of um, time frame is fine. Now, if you end up needing my help, I will go through and figure out every single date that your child got a service or didn't get a service. If we end up having to fight Boston on some of this, we are gonna need that information. But for your first CCS meeting, having a sense of the time frame and each service is fine. So this is the first step um, of where, where we're identifying services that are not available or inaccessible. And I will pause for questions there. Thank you. Kia. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, um, what if you can't even figure out if any services have be, are being offered by a teacher? It seems like, you know, my son needs reading, writing help, and everything is, is like, I just feel like his whole week is in front of the Lexia app. And the mm. Lexia, even though there's a teacher that tells him, so technically the teacher is telling them to use Lexia, so, I guess she's administering services, but I don't see my son's schedule changed anything pre-IEP or after IEP. He's just doing Lexia all day practically. And yes. ST Math, which is another online. I just don't see any human teaching. And we've never set foot in, despite a full inclusion seat, we've never set foot into a school. So Kia, I am gonna hazard a guess that based on what you just told me, that what's going on with your son is less of a CCS issue and more of a general um, FAPE, free and appropriate public education. That's what all kids with disabilities are entitled to. What you're describing is more of a general FAPE issue. Like from what you've said, like your child just isn't, it's not just because of the pandemic, like there's just a problem with their service delivery and what they're getting. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think again, like that is, it's hard for me to know exactly what to tell you without knowing more specific. So I'm going to ask you to, um, to reach out via email, call, text, um, Thank with any you. specifics, but my general impression based on what you said is that probably this is a faith problem, not a CCS problem. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Other questions. Okay. So now we will go to list number two, where we're going to talk about regression, which is a word that I hate um, because I think that, you know, the problem with using the word regression is that it's really putting sort of the blame on the student and saying this student fell behind. So I'm going to use the word regression because that's the word that the law uses. But I just want you to know that, you know, what regression is really tracking is not a student's failure. It is tracking a school's failure, a district's failure. Um, that's my caveat. Okay, so this question is really looking at where a child has lost skills that they once had. So first thing I'm going to suggest that you do is look at your child's goal section of the IEP. In each goal, it should say, here's what the student can currently do. I'll say if you've got a new IEP, please go back, look at the IEP that was written before March 2020. This should give you a written record of what your school said your child could do pre-March 2020. So that's the first step. Let's identify everything that the school says your child could do pre-March 2020. And I'm going to suggest you list them all out. Um, so maybe it says things like, you know, this student can do basic addition and subtraction. Maybe it says they're at a reading level O, whatever it says. Let's list all of those things out. And then just think to yourself, can my kid do that now? 
Like if it says that the student was, you know, able to do um, two and three digit multiplication, is that still something your child can do? If it says that, you know, your child was able to use coping skills to help calm themselves down when they were upset about half the time back in March, 2020, think, does that seem true now? Does that seem like something my child can still do? And this is important here. This is really asking like what you think, your opinion, because the state recognizes that the people who have been with their kids since March, watching them do school are parents. This isn't a situation where teachers are in rooms with kids every day. For most of our kids, it's their parents and their caregivers who are with them every day. So the state says, hey school, it's important to listen to what the caregiver says a student can do because they know they're the ones who are with them. So let's think about what do you think? Does this seem like something your child can do now? Once you've thought about everything that the school said your child could do back in February, 2020, think about your, your own ideas of what your child could do in February, 2020. Are there things that were easy for your child back in February, 2020 that are harder now? For example, I have a kid who used to get along really well with his siblings and now just like picks fights like there is no tomorrow. Um, maybe you have a kid who is willing to read or be read to every night before bed and now they're not. Maybe you have a kid who was, you know, learning to take the tea before this and now they won't leave the house. Those are all things that you should add to your list. Other things that you know that your child could do in February, 2020 that they can't do now. And now the next thing you're gonna do is talk to your child's outside providers. Does your child have an outside therapist or an outside occupational therapist, anybody who doesn't work for the school? And ask them, are there things that they have noticed that your child could do back in before all of this started that they struggle with more now? and add those to your list. So we've now got a list of things your school said that your kid could do, things you thought they could do, and things that outside providers said they could do that are harder for them now. That is a list to answer the second question, is how your child regressed. Questions about this? Liz, there is a question about, um, what should parents do when you or the independent evaluation conflicts with measures of regression progress compared to the quote unquote team? So what, what should you do when you have an evaluator who says that a child has regressed and you've got a team that says a child hasn't regressed? Is that, do I have that right? Yes, so the independent evaluation and the, the, and the parent and the independent evaluation are, are basically see, stating there is a regression, but the IEP school team is disagreeing with that. So what do you do then? Yes. Okay, that is going to be answered in our last slide, what to do when you and the school disagree. And Melinda has her hand up. Melinda? Um, my question was basically um, the same because it's it's really sometimes it's hard to get through these IEP meetings because they're not even listening to you. And so Melinda, so we, if it's about that, then we're going. She's going to cover that on the next slide. So well, okay. let's get there then. The last slide. The last slide. I promise. Oh, sorry. The last it's slide. It's hard to hear me describe what a school should do and to just sit there and think in your head, my school's not going to do that. Um, but I promise we will get that what to do when your child's school doesn't do this. Okay, now we're gonna make list three to answer our third question. And this one is about not making progress towards the IEP goals or not making progress towards the general curriculum. So the first thing to do is to pull out your child's special education progress reports from March, 2020 through the present day. Do they say your child is making progress? If they do, do you agree or disagree? Because there are some cases I do have clients where um, like I have a client who had chronic migraines and remote learning is actually a lot easier for her because it allows for a lot of a lot more flexibility. So she's actually doing much better. So there are some there may be some areas where maybe your child made progress in one area, but not in another. 
I should also say, if you don't have special education progress reports, you should go to your school and ask them for copies of all of your child's special education progress reports. I would ask for the last two years um, and see if they give them to you. And they should give them to you within 10 days. Next, take a look at your child's report cards, grades, or any other assessments from February 2020 to the present. Do they show progress? What we're doing here is looking for any sources of evidence that might show that your child's not making progress towards IEP goals or curriculum, if you feel like they're not making progress. And then the last thing here I would suggest is show your child's outside provider, your child's IEP goals, and ask them, do they think that this child has made progress towards these goals? If so, why? If not, why not? This is especially helpful if you have a provider who's working on along the same lines as some of the goals. So for example, if you have an outside occupational therapist and your child receives occupational therapy in school, asking the child's outside occupational therapist to take a look at the OT goal and see if the, they think the child has made progress towards it is a good, is a good way of doing that. <clears throat> and then we're gonna ask you to take a look at any recent evaluations. So if you've had any recent evaluations independent or done by the district, since the pandemic has started, since the school closures have started, look at those evaluations as compared to the pre-February 2020 evaluations. So for example, do they show that your child was at one particular reading level in January 2020, and they're now at the exact same reading level today? That shows they haven't been making progress towards their IEP goals. Um, so these are all of the things to look for now. And what I'm gonna suggest you make a list of is everything that shows a lack of progress. So that means if you've got a special education progress report that says the student isn't making progress, you wanna write that down. If you have your child's report cards or grades or assessments that show that the student is really struggling in school, you wanna list those out. If you have an outside provider who says, I've been seeing this kid for physical therapy every week for a year and I see that this problem continues. Or if you have a recent evaluation that shows, okay, the student is at the same level or lower than they were a year ago. Um, we wanna list all of those things out. That is to make the progress, um, to answer the progress question. Any questions about this, about how to demonstrate that a student hasn't made progress? Um, there's a question that's related, just asking, um, were we supposed to get progress reports during the pandemic? You sure were. Um, and if you didn't, I would encourage you to ask your school for them. And if they don't have them, I'm going to encourage you to file a complaint with the state or to reach out to us so that we can help. Thank you. And Luana, I think your, your question will be addressed in that last slide about when they're rejecting the, I, the independent evaluation and what your next step's gonna be. So she is gonna get there at the end, so thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna summarize these because that's a lot of material. So our first list is answering the question, were services not offered or inaccessible? You wanna have identified all the services your child should have received, but either were not offered or were not inaccessible and the time frame that your child did not receive those services. That's to answer the first question. The second question, remember that's about regression. So you wanna have your list of skills that your child could do in February, 2020, but cannot do or struggles with now. So that's using the IEP, your own experience and any outside provider's experience. Then we have list three, that's around progress. And there we wanna have the list of goals and whether your child has made progress towards them. And remember, this is using special education progress reports, report cards, your experience, provider's experience. That's putting it all together. And then last, the last thing to do is to then write down, I would do it on the same place, what you want your child to get. Again, I'm gonna encourage you to really think about what would truly help your child recover from what they have lost from their education during the pandemic. So, and remember that could include things like a placement change, extra services, 
new services, after school help, special education support after age 22, one-to-one -one small group support, anything else that you can think of that might be helpful. And I'm gonna pause here to just address the special education support after age 22. Um, this is important to, to know is that typically kids are no longer eligible for special education after they turn 22. But when kids have been deprived of their education like they have during this pandemic, um, I think it is reasonable to ask for a year, sometimes maybe even a little bit more um, of additional special education support um, for a student who's really struggled during the pandemic and is around you know, turning 22. Um, this could include things like um, you know, math and reading support, but it could also just be focused on transition services. So it might be that a student has a whole nother year of support that is just around transition services, things like job search, things like travel training. It could absolutely be the case that a student has a whole year where they are just working on an extra transition goal as a CCS service. Um, so does anyone have questions here about things to ask for or about um, transition services post 22. I know some folks had questions about that before. Um, it looks like Kim. Hi. So um, the school told me they're only going um, to discuss services from March until September. Mm. They will not. Yes. Just, yeah. Great question. We are going to get there. Okay. Uh, looks like Eliana. Hi, how are you? I'm um, okay, thanks. Sorry, I came in a little bit late. Um, but I was going to ask, like, um, like do, can, do I have, like, the authority to ask for my daughter's, like, missing um, time, like, on her IEP? Because, um, like, she had, like, um, she went to, like, a very bad school. I'm not going to say which one it was, and they wasn't really teaching her. And then, like, um, I'm the one that put her on the IEP, so mm -hmm. she was already, like, um, backed up because of the neglect at that school now she goes mm -hmm. to a better school and now she's um playing catch up but now like with the pandemic which is nobody's fault with the pandemic um mm -hmm. i need to know like how to ask advocate for her right um services because i want her to move forward you know as everybody else you know because i'm really pissed off about what that last school did to her mm -hmm. You know, because my daughter's not slow. I, know, I hope that doesn't sound cliche as a parent to say, but like, I know my daughter, she communicates very well. She's like, she can't put it on paper because they, they didn't even teach her how to read at that last school. I had to get my mm -hmm. own services for her. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was really bad, Elizabeth. I believe you. It sounds really bad. That sounds really stressful. Um, in this presentation today, we're, you know, we're sort of talking in a general way about how to give kids extra support for what they missed during the pandemic. But it sounds to me like you are describing um, really a bigger issue where it's not just about your daughter losing out during the pandemic. It's really about um, what this other school did to her and to you and how hard that was. So I'm gonna ask um, for you to reach out to me individually so oh, okay. I'm sorry. More. Oh, no. Nothing to apologize for. Do you hear Purdue Boston Legal Services? Yes. I will put um, my contact information is at the beginning and the end of this presentation, and I will also put it in the chat at the end. So everyone will be able to find me. Um, thank you, Eliana. Any other, are there any questions in the chat, yes. Roxy or Charlie? Um, so one question is, where are they? What if your child is 21 and in a residential placement? Is it reasonable to ask for him to stay longer? Yes. 
I mean, depending on the specifics of the situation. So if you have a student who's really struggled during the pandemic, who hasn't been able to access all of their services, who has demonstrated regression, then one possible remedy for that could be asking for additional time at the residential placement. Thank you. And another question from the chat is that given that many of our students are fragile, are there any mandates to include staff in after school settings that are licensed and trained to support um, students of special needs? I'm just thinking. Um, Massachusetts has licensing requirements. Um, I think that the after school help programs, you know, like in Massachusetts, we have programs where like college kids, you know, or you're the 17 year old down the block who like did great in some class before tutors kids. So there are programs like that. So I don't think it's the case that every after school program must have like credentialed special education teachers. But what I would say is that if you think that your child needs after school help with specifically a special education teacher, I would suggest that during your CCS meeting, you ask for after school help with a special education teacher, um, if that's what you think that your student needs. So I would suggest being specific about that in the meeting. And Barbara, I will get to you in one moment, but before that, it's the state holding, Elizabeth, do you know if the state is holding a recent policy that a school must graduate a student who meets local and MCAS requirements, or can we defer? I'm sorry, Russ, is the state enforcing the policy that schools must graduate students who meet MCAS? Yep, local and MCAS requirements. No, a student, not if they're a student with a disability, so a student with a disability can remain in school until they turn 22 um, if they have not um, accomplished their IEP goals. Thank you. Barbara. Yeah, I've got a question. Is this for only for Boston Public or also, you know how Boston Public has certain charter schools and some charter schools is this pertain to every school or just only Boston Public? That's a great question. Um, CCS applies to all public schools across the uh, across the state. So that means this applies to district schools and charter schools. If you've got a kid at like a Catholic school, for example, um, this isn't going to apply to the Catholic school. This would apply to Boston as the student as the school district where the student lives. So this applies to all district schools and all charter schools. Thank you. Because my granddaughter, she goes to KIPP Academy. I don't know, mm. I don't know if they really affiliated it with Boston Public School. I know they get their bus service from Boston Public, but I don't know if they part of Boston Public. KIPP is not part of Boston Public Schools. However, everything I am saying today also applies to KIPP, okay. even though they probably don't think that, but. <laughs> they <sorry>. do. <laughs> Okay. And Any one other question? before we move on, um, one question. What if I opt to send my child to private school next year, but they are old CCS services? Will BPS still have to provide these even if the child is no longer in public school? Um, I'm assuming that we're talking about a private independent school, like a Montessori or something like that, not like an out of district placement. Assuming we're talking about like one of those private schools that, you know, uh, one, one of those like a parochial or independent private school, Boston's obligation to provide CCS would, would continue. Um, my guess is they would likely try to work something out with you to provide the support before the new school year starts. Thank you. And last question, we'll have Melinda. Yes. Um, if you think that your child needs um, specific service, like um, for math or reading, um, is the school entitled to, you know, get you a tutor? Because um, I don't know if this has anything to do with now the services they put in place because of the pandemic, but this has been going on for a while. Like, I don't think my son has reached his certain goals. Um, how do I go about that? Well, I think... Um... 
Melinda, like, and I'm so sorry, I can't remember who asked this question earlier, that what you are describing is really a FAPE problem. It is a mm -hmm. general special education problem. What you're saying is, forget the pandemic, like my kid wasn't getting what he needed before the pandemic and wasn't making progress before the pandemic. Um, I think in that situation, it's hard to say like w whether what your student needs is like um, is a tutor or maybe they need like additional support in the classroom or maybe they need to be taught it in a different way. Um, but hard, hard to say exactly what might be helpful without knowing more. So, you know, you're welcome to welcome to give me a shout about your specific student. Thank you. All Thank right. Okay, good deal. Okay, we're gonna run through some what about. Um, so when should a CCS meeting happen? We already hit this. What if I'm asked to sign a waiver? Some folks have reported that the district has asked them to sign some kind of waiver. Um, you should not have to sign any kind of waiver. If that does happen to you, please let me know. Uh, can you get in-person CCS? Yes, you can. If your student needs in-person CCS, which most kids who need CCS are going to need it to be in person, that's the whole reason they need CCS in the first place, um, ask, ask for in-person and the district should provide that. This is a question, what about if my school says I can only get one of the options that DPS is providing, extended, extended school year, after school learning, or February, April vacation academies? They're wrong. That's not true. This needs to be an individualized assessment that really looks at what does this kid need to help them recover. <clears throat> okay, one thing I want to touch on is the difference between new IEP services and CCS. So an important thing to remember is that CCS are temporary services to help kids recover what they lost during the pandemic. If your child now needs a new service on a long-term basis, you might want to ask to amend their IEP rather than getting it as CCS. So for example, let's say you have a student where they've lost family during the pandemic or have had to deal with an eviction or are just are having a really tough time. And maybe you're thinking that they need to have counseling um, or some kind of other social emotional support to help get through this time. Maybe you think that once the pandemic sort of is over, whenever that happens, um, they'll be okay. That Then that counseling would be a good CCS option. But if you think like this has been really tough for your kids and they're gonna need some long-term support to try and get through it, you're gonna wanna ask them to add counseling to the student's IEP because it's not just a temporary thing that they're gonna need to get through the pandemic. It's something that you think they're gonna need for a while going forward. Um, my school mentioned general education recovery support or my favorite acronym, GERS. What is that? Here's what GERS is. Um, many students, maybe all students, will need help of all kinds to recover from the pandemic. So general education recovery support refers to services that the district is offering all kids. So there might be some kids with disabilities where when they return to school, they just like it's weird to be back in school and they just need support um, around like being used to being in a building all day. That's the kind of support that the district is going to be providing to all kids. So that's an example of general education recovery support. Kids can get this in addition to CCS. It's not like one or the other. I think most kids are gonna need both. Okay, so this is a big question. Is CCS to compensate students for all remote learning related regression or just for the period March to June, 2020? So the story here is that Boston is sometimes saying that they will only consider the period of March through June 2020 or sometimes March to September 2020. Um, I think that analysis is wrong. I'm going to tell you why. So the state, the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education defines CCS as, there's going to be a lot of jargon, bear with me, defines it as 
services that a student's IEP team determines are needed to remedy a student's skill or knowledge loss or lack of effective progress that resulted from delayed, interrupted, suspended, or inaccessible IEP services because of the emergency suspension of in-person education related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you'll bear with me for a minute for some sort of lawyerly analysis here. This definition says that CCS are services that kids get because of the emergency suspension of in-person education related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, so far as I am aware, schools continue to be closed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. When schools were closed in Boston in September, and then again in November, it was because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I don't see how the district can argue that somehow this ends as of June or September 2020. So I would encourage you to advocate for CCS for all remote learning related regression. And um, I am working on this, um, but I think it's for the, it should be for the whole period. Um, do we have any questions about that? While you pause and people are just thinking, reflecting on any questions, Charlie, can you pop in that survey for me, that poll for me, please? Thank you. You should all see a poll on your screen that you can answer three questions that are yes or no questions. And while you guys do that survey, I will unmute Ileana to ask a question. Oops, sorry about that. Ileana? Hi. Um, sorry, my name is Dacia. Ileana is my daughter. I'm using her computer. Oh, I'm sorry, Dacia. <laughs> I'm sorry. She was like, you didn't change the name. <laughs> no worries. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, I was going to ask... Um, Thank you. I was going to say thank you for this meeting, first of all. And um, I was going to ask, so I can ask for the um, CC, CCS um, accommodations for my daughter as well? Yes. So what is, what is that, like for extra help and stuff for the, due to the pandemic? Yes, that's exactly right. CCS is extra help for the students because of the pandemic. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, no worries, what? Ileana. And the big, the recording will be available in the slides, so you can review at your own leisure to kind of go over them again. And Elizabeth will share her contact information. Um, at the it's on in the end of the slides and in the chat, so that if you want to contact her after you've had time to reflect, you can do that also. Oh, okay. Thank you. Kim, you had a qu question also. Well, yeah, I have a concern. Um. So my daughter was already owed compensatory services from before the pandemic. And now I feel like because she was owed so many compensatory services from before, now she's owed even more from the pandemic that they're just going to try to shortchange me and try to make a FAPE issue a pandemic and just, just, just throw it all together. And I'm also afraid that I'm gonna have like so many meetings, you know, because they wanna have the IEP meeting separate and then they wanna have the compens compensatory service meeting separate than the COVID meeting. And I don't have that, you know, my daughter has special needs. I need to take care of my daughter, you know what I mean? Like, so that that's just a concern, like, you know, what do I do? Just say, hey, have the meeting all together. Or I have it, have one at a time and, and we'll discuss one at a time and you can't lump everything together. I mean, I think those are really, really reasonable fears, Kim. I mean, I think we've heard from other folks who do feel like they were shortchanged by the district or who are worried that like things maybe weren't going great before the pandemic. Now they're even worse. Like, what are we supposed to do? And that's, 
a really tough position to be in, I think. Um, I think as far as feeling like this is too many beatings, this is so overwhelming, this is so much, um, I think that is totally up to you. You know, Boston is supposed to hold these meetings, but if you feel like, Jesus, like I can't do all these meetings all this time, like let's postpone, like that is reasonable. If you want to put one off 30 days so that you can breathe for a half a second, that's not gonna, that doesn't hurt any services that your child could get. Um, I personally find that on like hour three of one of those jumbo IEP meetings, I just melt into the floor. So I'd rather have them spread out. But if you're like, no, I'd rather block out an afternoon, then, you know, go for it. I think that's totally reasonable. And I'll just repeat that, you know, if you do run into problems, um, you're, you're welcome to give us a, a call. And Elizabeth, a question from the chat is, can temporary sub-separate placement be CCS? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So, okay, so now we are gonna hit when schools and families disagree. So basically there's, oh, it looks like we have some kind of green. <laughs> looks like someone drew on the slide. I don't know how that happened. We'll just all try and ignore the little green squiggles on this slide. Um, so there are really two places to go if you and the school disagree, which absolutely could happen. So the first place is the Bureau of Special Education Appeals, the BSEA. Basically the deal with the BSEA is that uh, it is there to resolve any kind of special education concern. And there are really two things you can do. Um, one is requesting a mediation. To request a mediation, they're doing them remotely these days. All you have to do is call the number on the screen. Um, the mediator who covers Boston is a woman named Leslie. She is pretty good. Sometimes mediation can help, um, sometimes it can't. It, it depends on an individual school and sort of the strength of your case but you do not need a lawyer for mediation. It is a fairly calm, like chill way to try and resolve the dispute. So if you feel like the school is being totally unreasonable here, um, I just need a person who works for the state to tell them that, a mediation can be helpful. All you have to do is call that number. The second thing, if that doesn't work, or if you feel like you don't have time for that, is a due process hearing. A due process hearing is like, uh, fake court. It's not like real court and that no one's a judge or your honor. There are no robes. It doesn't happen in a courtroom. It happens around a conference table. I mean, now it happens over Zoom, but it used to happen around a conference table. Um, but these kinds of hearings often have lawyers. There are exhibits. There are cross witnesses and they're cross examined and opening and closing statements and all that good stuff. Um, if you aren't having luck with mediation or, and you think you might need a hearing, I'm gonna encourage you to reach out to us um, because those are hard to win um, without a lawyer or an advocate, unfortunately. The second is the problem resolution system. Uh, this is the state's complaint system. This one, you can file it online. It's super easy. All you have to do is say, here's my name, here's my kid's name. I'm upset because the school did X and I want the school to do Y. This process takes 60 days, which is typically faster than a due process hearing. Um, and SpedPAC, we did a whole other meeting specifically about these two dispute resolution options. So um, if you have more questions about that, you can go back and look at that meeting. Um, yeah, and then last, so when to call us for help? First of all, you can always call, but I'm gonna encourage you to let the first thing you do being asking for a meeting, in this case, it's gonna be a CCS meeting and ask for what you want, follow up with it in writing. So if you have a CCS meeting and the district is saying, no, we don't think your child has regressed. If you can, I would suggest going ahead and sending them an email and just saying, we had the CCS meeting, you said my child didn't regress, I disagree and here's why. That's just to try and establish some kind of record. Um, and if you think at any point you might end up having to reach out to an attorney or an advocate, 
go ahead and request your child's special education and academic records from the past two years, um, because that can take a little while for the district to give it to you. And it's the first thing I'm gonna do if you reach out to us. Um, and it's 2.30, so I'm gonna leave it there. This is my contact information. Um, just a note that if you're not a current client, it may take us up to 48 hours to get back to you, but I promise that we will. Um, and I'll hang out for a minute to see if folks have more questions. One question, Liz, is BPS required to put their denial in writing? You know, I don't know. They are required to put their CCS offers in right. I, I'll say my position to that would be yes, that they should have to provide a, what's called an N1 um, that says we had the CCS meeting and we decided not to do this. We don't think this child needs it. Um, but I do not have the guidance in front of me and cannot confirm that for sure. I will confirm it and tell you in an email, Roxy. Now that'd be useful. We'll post it. Then the other question is, will the district give you a document that says you've had a CCS meeting? Yes, the district should give you a CCS. Sometimes they're called like CCS service delivery plans. Sometimes it just says N1, Notice of School District Proposal. But they should give you something in writing following the CCS meeting saying, here's what we're proposing. Great. Thank you. I just hey, want to say- uh, Hey, there's one question from a- a participant that I'm not exactly sure how to, I, I'm not understanding the question. So I'm actually searching for her. Uh, is it um, Genevieve Paul? Can you raise your hand, please, so I can unmute you? Roxy, do you see her? There it is. She has a question, I believe, for Liz. Has Genevieve been unmuted? I'm asking her. I'm asking to unmute her right now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Yes, my daughter um, was approved for the February um, break uh, CCS tutorials for math and reading. And um, the form that they sent me did not have the link. And she's supposed to start on the 16th. So I don't know how she's supposed to access the, um, the course from 9 to 12 when they, they only said it's on Catapult, but they didn't send me any link or any information and how to do that, and that starts Tuesday. Centoria, are you still on the call? Uh, would you be, uh, from parent engagement, to speak of how she might be able to access that, the Catapult February Vacation um, CCS program? Let me just ask her to unmute. Yeah, Centoria, are you aware of how she would do yes. that? Yes. I missed the question. Can you, add, can you say it again, please, Roxy? Oh, sure, sure. It's the Catapult, you know, uh, CCS services are being offered during um, February vacation for, and Catapult is the online agency's doing it. We yeah. have a parent who says she was actually told her child is part of that, but she doesn't have to have the information how her child can start on Tuesday. Oh, and she won't be able to call her school. Let, I will call Monica and have her, um, we can reach out to Ethan. If she could email me today, then I'll know who she is specifically, or Roxy, if you can give me her information, and I'll reach out to Ethan today to get the um information, please. All right, sounds good. So Genevieve, just put in, you can either message me directly or to Centoria, you just need to put your email in there so we can figure out what, what that start is for you. Wait, can I have your name? Because this my screen just went out. Sure. And, so and your my, email then, mm -hmm. and then your email. Sure. Or I so can give it to you in. right now. I don't care. Is that, can I just give it to you right now? Sure, you can put it, put it in the chat and we'll take care of it there. No, oh. but the chat is gone from, my, from screen my screen is what I'm trying oh, to Oh, you can't put it in the chat, okay. Yeah, oh. it somehow just disappeared. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, I got it back. Got it? Right. Um, and what is your, oh, your Roxy. Okay, so I'll send yeah, it right to you now. It, well, actually, Centoria just put her, her email address. It's Centoria. Um, so Roxy, myself, we, we are... Part, we're actually parents like you, so we're we're helping facilitate. So to get your answers directly, um, Centoria Grant just put her email address in the chat, and she would she is the one that would be um, remediating this for you directly from Boston Public Schools. Genevieve, if you could email me, um, I can email you directly and give you the get the information um, that you need. Okay. 
perfect, perfect. Thank you all. Um, and I just want to make sure we spread out people's opportunity to ask questions. Sharon Dara, I'm going to ask you to unmute. I probably messed that up. It's Sharon. It just got all, it's Sharon. Oh, Sharon Dora. Oh, I remember. Okay, yes. Hi, Roxy. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask a question just about the, the issue of data. Um, so we were, we had a meeting and we were told that they agreed with us that there was regression, but we were denied CCS because there was no data. And we feel as if we are the data. Um, I've been homeschooling my child since March because he can't access any screen learning. Um, so I'm just curious about this, this issue of data. And when a school says, we agree there's been regression, but there's no data, let's revisit this in the spring. I, I feel like other families could run into this, which is why I'm bringing it up. So not just for specific advice, but how would you, how would you approach that? Yeah, um, that's definitely inconsistent with state law. So the guidance that the state has put out actually specifically says that caregivers are a really important source of data. The guidance, you know what? Um, I don't have it handy in the chat, but I will email it to Roxy when I send the slides. It's also linked to in the slides. So it's fairly readable. Um, and the guidance has a part where it actually lists all of the different sources of data that schools are supposed to use. And the first one listed is the experience of parents and caregivers. Um, so I, it's also very weird for the school to say that they agree with you, but there's no data because obviously there is data, otherwise they couldn't have agreed with you. Um, so I, I would suggest pushing back with the guidance and if that doesn't work, um, that's probably gonna be a BSEA or PRS issue. Yeah. Thank you. So the time, it is now 2.40, so we are 10 minutes over. I know Melinda and that, that's the, you've had opportunities to ask other questions and Liz has also shared our contact information so that if you want follow-up questions about your particular circumstances, you can reach out to her and she'll be more than willing to um, answer your additional questions. So most, I, I honestly wanna thank Elizabeth McIntyre just for being here and sharing her expertise with us and given our families an opportunity to know what their rights and their options are so that when they go into these CCS meetings, they really know what they should try to have with them and the information and that it's not just all about online CCS or a rubber stamp option. It is literally about what your child needs. So I hope that has been beneficial to everyone and feel free to follow up with us. As I mentioned, we will post the slides in the recording next week on um, SpedPak's YouTube at, and our website. But if you have any questions or anything, you want to reach out to Elizabeth. She shared her contact information and it will also be on the slides there. So thank you all for joining us today. And thank you very much, Liz. We really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Take good care.